there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. And those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, the fate of the greatest amphibious landing in history and the liberation of Europe depends on a collection of remarkable machines. Vehicles like this, while they may not get all of the glory of, say, a Sherman tank, they're significant in winning wars. Machines that were pushed to breaking point. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up the mountains, you could take it in the desert, across fields, through rivers, it didn't matter, it kept going. The heroic exploits of their drivers were legendary. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They come like knights in shining armory. They are the true liberators. They're like the knights of the round table, these guys. Day, June 6th, 1944. After nearly five years of war, the long planned for liberation of Europe from Nazi rule has arrived. Over 6,000 vessels transport troops and equipment across the Channel from England towards the Normandy beaches in northern France. D Day was the biggest ever amphibious operation mounted in history. The scale was truly breathtaking. By the end of the first day, a 50-mile beachhead had been secured. But victory in Europe depended on more than just a successful landing and first 24 hours. The need was to put something like 100,000 men ashore, virtually on day one, and then to continue the backup, the immense backup, of troops coming forward on day two, three, four, five, etc., to push the battle for Normandy forward. It was enormous. Britain, the United States, and their allies faced a formidable enemy. After D-Day, the Allied push towards Germany would test both troops and machines. There were a number of vehicles the Allies relied on to get men and munitions ashore for the push towards Berlin. This is an example of a combat machine which truly broke the mold. The DUKW, known affectionately by the GIs as the Duck. It has a trick up its sleeve. It's a two and a half ton truck that is just as happy at sea as it is on land. This ingenious vehicle was designed to overcome a problem that had plagued invading armies for centuries. The delivery of troops, and supplies to invasion beaches. This takes time and makes them vulnerable to enemy attack. This vehicle can drive off of a landing craft into the water, float to shore, driven by a propeller, and then when you get to shore, you switch it over to the wheel drive so you don't have to deal with the process of 
taking things to the beach on a boat, unloading them, and then putting them on a truck to move inland. You can just drive ashore and continue on like any old truck. Which meant that the men were under fire for a much lesser period of time, and you can move them much more quickly. This amphibious truck was the brainchild of an American racing yacht designer named Rod Stevens. He took the chassis of a General Motors company truck and encased it in a steel hull. Powered by a six-cylinder engine, it can do 50 miles per hour on land and six knots in the water. It has a rudder and propeller at the rear, and the front wheels also help it steer. Watertight seals and thick grease keep any water out. Essentially, this vehicle needs very little preparation. Uh, once it's in the water, uh, working like a boat with the propeller spinning, uh, once you get to shore, all the operator has to do is shift a lever, basically, and it turns it into uh, a land-going vehicle. Uh, the propeller shaft is no longer spinning, and there's now drive to the wheels. In 1942, Rod Stevens and his team built a prototype in just over a month. It was given the code letters D, meaning 1942, U, meaning amphibian, K, denoting front wheel drive, and W, rear wheel drive. But Stevens' fast work was wasted. The US Army took little interest in this strange looking craft. Then in the spring of 1942, a US Coast Guard ship ran aground off Cape Cod and it looked as though the ship and her crew were doomed, until they turned for help to the DUKW. In just 10 minutes, the duck reached the stricken vessel, saving the lives of all on board. President Roosevelt himself got to hear of the rescue, and a large order for the ducks soon followed. 20,000 would be constructed between 1942 and 1945. The DUKW was first tested under fire in the Allied invasion of Sicily in July 1943, as American, Canadian and British forces attempted to force Italy out of the war. Now it's fair to say the DUKW performed very well indeed. It was ideal, it could carry a couple of tons of supplies, or 24 fully armed infantry. So it was a very good vehicle, it was very versatile. The Allies knew that D-Day would be a sterner test. But confidence amongst DUKW drivers was high. They gave us a sort of pep talk. They said we were going to invade France in the morning. I thought, so what? I drive in and out of the ocean hundreds of times. The DUKWs worked hard. In the early days of the D-Day invasion, they brought 40% of the 14,500 tons of supplies carried to the beaches each day. As soon as we hit the shore on D-Day, we were rushed into service. The fact that we hadn't had any sleep for more than 24 hours didn't matter. The combat troops were in dire need of food and ammunition. As the British, Canadian, and American troops and their allies slowly advanced through Normandy, they faced a formidable enemy. The Germans would fight tooth and nail to hang on to what they had. They realized every yard the Allies covered was a yard nearer Berlin, so it was gonna be a very, very tough fight indeed. The Nazi war machine would fight a fierce rearguard action testing Allied ingenuity to its limits. In terms of the liberation of Europe, having vehicles which are easy maintained, plentiful, rugged and reliable was absolutely vital. The DUKWs had some innovative features to help them adapt to a range of terrain. They were expected to run on both sand and road, but this meant manually changing the tire pressures, placing the drivers in grave danger. So in late 1943, an ingenious tire inflation system was devised that could be operated from the driver's seat. A compressor powered by the engine fed all six tires. That meant the pressure could be adjusted without stopping. Even tires riddled with bullet holes could be kept inflated. 
As the Allies advanced, the DUKWs proved to be remarkably effective combat machines. When the Germans retreated, they blew up bridges over rivers and canals to hamper the Allied advance, but the DUKWs were able to cross the water with ease. Who needs bridges when the ducks are willing and able? Our tanks were penetrating deeper into Germany's soul by the hour, and race we did. A lot of attention uh, is given to um, the, the well-known systems, the tanks, the bombers, the, the fighter planes, and they're significant, always. But while the shooters get all of the glory, it's trucks and other equipment, like this amphibious duck, that allowed the military to continue uh, providing the supplies and indeed also uh, the, win the war, essentially, through materiel. So vehicles like this, while they may not get all of the glory of, say, a Sherman tank, they're significant in winning wars. To help the Allied armies succeed in their aim of pushing into Germany and ultimately securing victory, the troops the DUKW supplied needed a swift, light, tactical vehicle. It is an ideal all-terrain vehicle. It can be used as a weapons platform if mounted with machine gun. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up the mountains, you could take it in the desert, across fields, through rivers. It didn't matter, it kept going. This iconic vehicle would be tested in some of the toughest operations of the Second World War. In the summer of 1944, the fate of Europe depended on the Allied plan to land over 150,000 troops on the beaches of Normandy, and then race to Berlin to defeat Nazi Germany getting there before the Soviets coming from the east. Success relied on the skill and courage of the troops and the quality of their machinery. Modern, fast-moving warfare meant that both sides needed a tactical vehicle that was lightweight and versatile. The Germans possessed one. This is the Kubelwagen. It began life as a peacetime vehicle, the best-selling People's Car, or Volkswagen, designed in the early 1930s by the legendary Ferdinand Porsche. After a directive from the German army, Porsche took his famous design and turned it into a combat machine. Basically, it was a Volkswagen, um, however, with a couple of modifications, higher suspension, so it had a, a higher land clearance, and also a more rugged chassis, as well as having a lower gearbox so that it could be driven both at walking pace and also to go at the highest speeds that the Volkswagen, as well as the Kubelwagen, were very well known to getting up to. A key element of the Kubelwagen's reinforced chassis was a single steel plate that formed the whole of its underside which was able to deflect, say for instance, rocks or pebbles going into the inside of the car. The main concept of that was basically to protect the vulnerable underside of the car, same way that you would do with a tank or even with a truck. In the summer of 1943, a captured Kubelwagen was taken to the United States for a series of tests. The Americans wanted to know if anything could be learned to improve their version of the machine. A vehicle that was beginning to make a name for itself on the battlefield. A vehicle that would become one of the most famous combat machines in history. The Jeep. By the time of D-Day, the Jeep was battle-proven, having been used in North Africa uh, and, and Italy. And one of the great things about the Jeep was it was proven to be soldier-proof. Soldiers have a really nasty habit of breaking stuff, and that's the key to a good military design. It's got to be robust, utilitarian, and pretty much unbreakable. And the Jeep ticked all those boxes. Back in July 1940, 
The US Army had asked car manufacturers to come up with a design for a rugged four-wheel drive reconnaissance vehicle. A small company named Bantam won the bid and provided a working prototype in only 49 days. But their triumph was short-lived. Unfortunately, Bantam simply wasn't a big enough company to compete with the larger players. Uh, the design it came up with and the prototype it came up was ideal. Unfortunately, it just didn't have the wherewithal to produce them in large enough numbers. The manufacturing contracts for Bantam's Jeep went to two much larger American firms, Willys and Ford. US Army policy was never to name their vehicles, and so the trucks rolling off the production lines were simply known as the quarter-ton truck 4x4. Jeep was shorthand for GP, government purpose, the generic term for military vehicles in World War II. Although it had been used in the campaigns in North Africa and Italy, it was the liberation of Europe that would push the Jeep to its limit. With any military vehicle, it's got to be able to function really well off-road. The minute it breaks down off-road, it's useless. With the Jeep, you could take it anywhere. You could drive it up the mountains, you could take it in the desert, across green fields, through ploughed fields, through rivers. It didn't matter, it kept going. It can be used to pull the trailer, so you can fill the Jeep with kit, you can fill it with people. It can be used as a weapons platform if mounted with machine guns. So you can carry a lot of supply with a relatively small vehicle and over any bad ground that you choose. Jeeps were also used to lay smoke to deceive the enemy, to carry the wounded, to carry dignitaries visiting the battlefield, including King George VI and President Roosevelt. Jeeps even became communion tables in church services. And when movie stars were asked to promote US war bonds, the iconic Jeep was chosen to carry them. Back on the battlefields of France in the summer of 1944, the Jeep was in the thick of the action, often leading the charge. The newly formed British Special Air Service, the SAS, liked it because it was fast and its specially designed combat wheels still functioned even when the tires were deflated. The Jeep's headlights could be tilted up to illuminate the engine for urgent nighttime repairs. Following the D-Day landings, I mean, the Jeep remained what it was, a jack of all trades, uh, and was used for hit and run raids by the SAS, the Seas Bridges. They spent a lot of time supporting the French resistance, darting about France. Once again, the Jeep showed its versatility. For these raids, they wouldn't be driven into position, they would be flown in. Now, a Jeep, because it's compact, relatively light, fits very nicely into a glider. If your glider lands successfully, you open the doors, you roll the Jeep out, press the starter motor, and off you go. By August 1944, the Germans had lost control of most of Normandy the SAS devised a plan to block enemy units, retreating through the so-called Paris-Orléans Gap. It was called Operation Wallace. The idea of Operation Wallace was to actually disrupt enemy communications and to support the resistance. This was highly successful, but the key to that mission was speed, and obviously the Jeep enabled them to bomb through what had been uh, effectively bandit territory in the face of the retreating Germans. And the sheer psychological factor of having swiftly moving vehicles behind their own lines, which could easily be part of a much larger attack, was something which helped to unhinge the German defense. For weeks, the SAS wreaked havoc amongst enemy bases and troop convoys. The Royal Air Force were able to drop 12 new jeeps to replace ones the SAS lost in battle. The jeep became a vital resource in the next key campaign of World War II. By September 1944, the Allied armies were close to the German border. The Americans in the south and the British and Canadians to the north. 
British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery pushed for airborne drops of paratroopers to secure bridges in Holland in an operation known as Market Garden, immortalised in the classic British film A Bridge Too Far. Once again, jeeps were to be dropped to assist the troops. The role of the jeep in this operation was quite interesting because it was the prime mover of the parachutists when they were on the ground. This use of the jeep by airborne forces was really intended to boost their functions, first to give them the capacity to transport their supply and to give them a reconnaissance capacity of the eyes and ears of your airborne force. The jeep had a much bigger impact in the Second World War than it's often given credit for. It's one of those vehicles which was produced in huge numbers and could do almost anything. This was not an advantage enjoyed by the enemy. Their production of vehicles was nowhere near as great. And as a result, small unit mobility was often better with the Americans or the British than it was with their enemies. For the people of occupied Europe, there was one vehicle in particular that came to represent their hard-won freedom, often arriving even ahead of the jeeps. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They are the true liberators. They're like the Knights of the Round Table, these guys. For one village in particular, a Harley Davidson and her rider would become a legendary hero. In the months after the D-Day invasion in June 1944, the Americans, Canadians, British and their allies had to fight hard to break out beyond the borders of Normandy and France. Hitler had told his troops in early July that every square kilometre must be defended tenaciously. It was a battle of attrition. The Germans had to be ground down. Slowly, village after village was liberated. One American GI wrote, to be 19 and fight for the liberation of France from the Nazis in the summer of 1944, at time of hot and cloudless blue days, when we shouted strange phrases in words we didn't understand, to men and women who cheered us as if we were gods. Racing ahead of the Allied tanks and troops, were reconnaissance units on machines which, more than any other, came to symbolize the coming liberation. It was the first sight of freedom, the iconic Harley-Davidson WLA. In the late 1930s, the uh, reconnaissance units of the United States Army were still heavily horse-related. But by the late 1930s, they wanted to mechanize those troops, and they were looking into uh, solutions to replace the horses by motor vehicles. The Army ordered some motorcycles from the different brands, such as Indian and Delco and Harley-Davidson, to test them and to see what they could, uh, could do. It was Harley-Davidson who had proved themselves to be one of the United States' most innovative motorcycle manufacturers who won the bidding war. Over 90,000 WLAs would be produced between 1942 and 1945. They were used for escort, courier, radio and reconnaissance duties. One of the strengths of the WLA was that it was reliable and easily maintained by the rider. The WLA is a very basic motorcycle um, based on a civilian model. It is equipped with a 750cc V-twin engine and it drives the gearbox through a primary chain on the left side and then the rear wheel through a secondary chain on the right side. Early Harley-Davidson's had an inefficient oil system that meant the rider had to manually regulate the lubricant whilst riding. In the 1930s, a new, more dependable automatic oiling system was devised. Oil from a tank beside the fuel tank was circulated through the engine via an oil pump. Oil was then pumped up to the oil tank for recirculation. 
This so-called dry sump system gave the WLAs a longer operational life. Although the engine was world-class, the WLA was a tough bike to master. It has brake on the right side and foot clutch on the left side, so it has no clutch on the handlebars. You change gears with by hand on the left side of the tank. You have throttle on the right and ignition spark advance on the left. So it is really fairly complicated to ride if you are not used to it. But the Harley riders loved their bikes, as they were reliable, easily maintained, and well kitted out for combat. With blackout lights, a gun rack for a rifle or submachine gun, and an ammunition box and large luggage rack with leather saddlebags. The German army had their own hard-working motorbike, the BMW R75. It was designed for a direct combat role. You never see a motorcycle or any kind of motorcycle unit being employed in such large numbers as the Germans did. The BMW R75 was powered by a 750cc side valve engine that gave it a top speed of 59 miles per hour. The motorcycle was designed to carry three men, one machine gun and two riflemen. Each motorcycle in a squad of, say for instance, 10 motorcycles, that would be a platoon worth of 30 men who are very heavily armed. They would have been able to give suppressive fire and be able to get in and out of tricky situations if needs be. So they converted their bikes into, if you like, mini Jeeps in a way. There were two wheel drive Jeeps, but I think there was a drive through the sidecar as well. And these, of course, they were fast, they were versatile, and they were very good for the reconnaissance role. And they were also armored. So they used their bikes, perhaps, should we say, rather more aggressively. As the US Army advanced through Europe in the summer and autumn of 1944, the Harley WLA took on a new, vital, and dangerous role. Motorcycle scouts at the head of advancing army columns, and not as well armed as their German counterparts, were given the task of seeking out enemy positions and radioing back with urgent intel. Obviously, if you're advancing, even if the enemy's retreating, you have to assume that he may well have left a rear guard in any defended area, or certainly he may well have booby-trapped. The Germans are very good at booby-trapping the area. So you always have to make sure you have reconnaissance forces in place first before you bring the rest of your armoured formations up, just so the enemy hasn't sprung any surprises. The motorcycle scouts were often the first Allied soldiers the French and Belgian civilians saw. The GI's distinctive bikes soon acquired a nickname, the Liberator. One American in particular became a folk hero for the people of Belgium. His name was 21-year-old James Carroll, a scout with the 628th Tank Destroyers Battalion. At the eve of the 3rd of September, they were in the woods at Condé, a small village on the French-Belgian border. Carroll's commanding officer sent him into Belgium to see what was going on, if there were still German troops uh, in the villages. And Carroll crossed the border on his Harley Davidson and he took the main road into Perue. Perue was a small Belgian town that had been under Nazi occupation for four harsh years. <laughs> C'était très méchant et il cherchait à, à nous prendre si nous faisions la moindre chose qui n'était pas tout à fait dans les règles. Les, les, les hommes étaient appelés, ils les embarquaient le lendemain matin, oui. C'était un peu. On the morning of the 3rd of September, 1944, James Carroll cautiously made his way into Peraway and parked his bike close to the town's church. He spoke to the priest who told him that the Germans were in the process of moving out. 
Oui, les Allemands fouillés repartaient vers l'Allemagne. Leur but, c'était de fuir. As carefully as he could, Carroll then headed out of the town to get help. He returned shortly after with a unit from the French resistance. News of the young GI's arrival soon spread. J'étais chez moi, mes parents, et quand j'ai entendu les cloches, c'est assez à se débrouiller. Et on a crié que les, les Américains arrivaient. Alors tout le monde est en folie, vraiment. Les Américains sont arrivés très calmement sur ça. Arrêtez la Richmond. Tout le monde l'a félicité. Elle a embrassé. C'était merveilleux. Pierre Dupré is a local historian fascinated by James Carroll's story. Donc voici la photo de la Grand Place. Et comme vous le voyez, James est fleuri et la petite fille euh, l'accueille au nom de tous les habitants. Ensuite, il a refait demi-tour parce qu'il était en observation et il est allé annoncer à, au Tank Destroyer que Pérou était libéré, qu'il n'y avait plus d'Allemands. These guys look like they've stepped out of a movie. They are driving these becoming iconic vehicles. They have so much of everything. They have so many rations. They have chocolate. They have cigarettes. They've got nylons. They come like knights in shining armor. It's a romantic view. They are the true liberators. They're like the knights of the round table, these guys. Perouet never forgot James Carroll and his motorbike and was sad when they'd heard he'd been killed a few weeks later. Pierre Dupré was determined to find Carol's final resting place so they could honor their first American. Alors je me suis promis de le retrouver, ce premier Américain, soit dans un cimetière ou soit vivant aux États-Unis. Donc nous avons essayé par l'intermédiaire par des des associations de vétérans américains de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale de retrouver notre premier Américain. But the village discovered to their delight that James Carroll had survived the war and was very much alive. Donc c'est Colette, mon épouse, qui a décroché le téléphone et qui a entendu James lui dire « It's me, I'm, I'm still alive ». On s'est regardé. On s'est dit que c'était vraiment génial d'avoir qu'il qu était encore vivant. Et alors on s'est demandé, tiens, comment peut-on l'honorer Et la meilleure façon, c'était de faire une fête et de l'inviter. So in 1995, almost 50 years after he first arrived, he returned once more to Paraguay as their special guest. Quand je revu, effectivement, nous a... On s'est plusieurs, puis... Nous étions des anciens combattants. Et bien sûr, ça nous a remémoré tout ce qu'il a fait. C'est vraiment héroïque. Beaucoup de gens étaient là, surtout pour voir le vétéran. Et nous avions à l'époque uniquement un convoi de véhicules américains, anglais. James Carroll returned to Paraguay every September for the next five years. Ben, disons, moi, je le considérais un peu comme, un, comme le grand-père de la famille. Hein. Il faisait partie de la famille. Et alors, je me souviens toujours la dernière fois qu'il est venu. Il avait, disons, chaque fois qu'il revenait, chaque fois en uniforme. Et puis, je le vois encore sa valise ouverte en me disant, je ne saurais pas le mettre, je vais te le laisser. Donc, il nous a laissé son uniforme en, en se doutant très bien qu'il ne reviendrait plus. Hein. In June 2005, James Carroll passed away at his home in America. Four years later, a statue was erected by the grateful people of Belgium in tribute to all the Harley bike riders who liberated them in the months after D-Day. Their exploits and their iconic machines will never be forgotten. As the Allied armies moved across France and Belgium in 1944, the Liberator was a key part of that success. But that success posed a problem, a lack of supplies of food and equipment. 
And so a solution was devised. A rolling convoy system that became the stuff of legend. The British, Canadian and American troops and their allies, who fought hard to liberate Europe in 1944 and 45, relied on a series of remarkable machines. From the DUKW amphibious vehicle to the Jeep and the Harley-Davidson WLA. Supporting them was an unsung hero, a vehicle that would help the Allies solve a problem of their own making. In the weeks leading up to D-Day, the French railway network had been repeatedly attacked by the British and Americans. Although this had hindered German attempts to defend the beaches, it left a huge logistical problem for the Allies, how to supply their troops, especially because the channel ports were still under German control. When you're waging industrial war, and when you just stage a very successful amphibious operation, but you're pushing out at what is effectively enemy-held territory, logistics are absolutely vital. Without supply, the army just stops. At the end of August 1944, as the Allied forces pushed even deeper into France, an ingenious plan was devised to create a rolling convoy system nicknamed the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball Express is one of the most innovative supply solutions of all time. As the Allies moved north through France, away from the Normandy beachheads, as the supplies kept coming in, 6,000 trucks, mainly American trucks, were used on a vast one-way system. You've got to bring the food for the troops and the medical supplies, and you've got to take back the wounded. And the Red Ball Express essentially kept a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week highway going from the invasion front, which had been Normandy, uh, up to the, the front lines, and, which were getting further and further from the beaches of Normandy as the war progressed uh, through 1944 and into 1945. The Red Ball Express was named after a famous 19th century fast freight service on the Santa Fe Railroad in New Mexico. The backbone of the 1944 version was this US Army vehicle, the two and a half ton cargo truck nicknamed the Jimmy. Powered by a 90 horsepower engine that gave it a top speed of 50 miles per hour. It could cross water almost three feet deep and climb a 65 degree slope. And they were more than just workhorses. If required, the Red Bull trucks could take a direct combat role. Uh, in some cases, if they're working close to the front where they might encounter enemy fire or uh, run into pockets of resistance, uh, they could actually mount a machine gun on this truck with a ring over the driver's and uh, co-driver's cab. At their peak, these trucks were supplying 28 Allied divisions with 12,500 tons of food, fuel and equipment a day. In October 1944, American General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allied Supreme Commander, wrote to encourage officers and men of the Red Ball Express, You are doing an excellent job, but the struggle is not yet won. So the Red Ball Line must continue the battle it is waging so well, with the knowledge that each truckload which goes through to the combat forces cannot help but bring victory closer. This truck is not only an important part of America's military history, it's an important part of its social history too. Most of the drivers on the Red Ball Express were African American. Their vital role has been overlooked for decades. At the time, very few African Americans were allowed to serve in the fighting units. So it, it was particularly significant that their contribution to the war was so great, even though they don't get the recognition that a lot of the troops at the front lines and the fighting troops got. You can essentially credit victory in, in no small part to their work as well. Uh, they were a significant part of the logistical supply of an advancing Allied army. The driver's work was hard and full of risk. 
Red Bull convoys were quite dangerous simply because they were quite often travelling through territory where mines had not been cleared, there were still pockets of German resistance, they could get strafed, and also in the name of getting supplies through, these things ran 24 hours a day pretty much, which meant the drivers were very tired and accidents were quite common. But if it was dangerous for the Allied supply vehicles, for the Germans under heavy bombardment, it was often a suicide mission. The backbone of their supply network was a truck that didn't come from the factories of Germany, but the factories of France. After France surrendered in June 1940, over 6,000 of these Citroen U23 trucks were commandeered by the German army. They were badly needed. There's this stereotypical view of the Germans going into the Second World War fully prepared to go up against the Allies, and it was simply not the case. You see many cases of the Germans using vehicles from Skoda, Citroen, and other foreign nations to bolster their own war effort against these nations and their allies. The French had used these Citroens as supply vehicles, as ambulances and radio cars. But the Germans saw they had greater potential. After the occupation of France, the first thing that they did was they improved the chassis, they reinforced the chassis and improved the brakes. They gave it hydraulic brakes, which basically made the Citroen U23 more reliable and also it made its total laden weight up to a massive four tons compared to how it was back before the modifications of 1.5 ton. The Citroen was now capable of carrying almost twice as much as its Red Bull rival, the Jimmy. But the German policy of using other nations' transport for their war effort had a dangerous flaw. The result was a wide variety of vehicles, each with different maintenance schedules and requiring different parts. Whereas Red Bull trucks like the Jimmy, produced in their thousands, were entirely standardized and reliable. The Germans realized too late the need to standardize their trucks. By 1944, Allied attacks made it impossible. And their vehicles had a further weakness. The Germans had a tendency to overcomplicate their engineering. Their engineering was brilliant, but in many ways it was more sophisticated, too sophisticated for the job in hand. By November 16th, 1944, the French railways had been repaired and channel ports were open along the Allied line of advance. The decision was taken to finally halt the Red Bull convoys. By then, the two and a half ton truck had proved itself to be one of the most significant machines of the conflict. US General Patton described it as their most important weapon. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. We give so much credit to the tanks and the fighter planes and the bombers, but trucks like this allow mechanized warfare to move forward and they're an essential part of the battle. Victory in Europe finally came in May 1945. It was achieved by a combination of heroism, superior firepower, and machines that proved to be fit for purpose. Skilled at fast reconnaissance, pioneering, strong, and versatile. In those hard-fought months after D-Day, these groundbreaking machines, designed and built at speed, became symbols of liberation for millions and secured themselves a lasting legacy.